everybody. Thank you so much for giving up your time to speak with me this morning. My name's Amy Cox. I'm a solicitor at Son Macmillan Walker. I'm a founder member of Women in Criminal Law and the head of the mentoring team. I'm really pleased to say that with the assistance of some wonderful judges, Wickle have been able to offer our members the possibility of joining a judicial mentoring circle. We began, I think our first was in September 2018, and we've now created 10 circles with approximately six members in each. Today I'm joined by some of those amazing judges, and I thank you not only for your time this morning, but also for the time that you've given to the mentoring circles. We are extremely grateful. What I'd like to start with is asking you each to introduce yourself just briefly, um, in respect of your journey and also particularly any mentoring experiences you had along the way. Well, um, I was called to the bar in 1975. I've never really done anything except criminal law. And I was at the bar for 32, nearly 33 years. Um, nearly 10 of those uh, in silk. I then became a judge and I went to uh, Snaresbrook Crown Court uh, where I was for um, three and a half years before there was an advert to apply to the Old Bailey for a, a position there. I would never have had the courage to make the application if it hadn't been for a deal of encouragement. In fact, from um, two... Uh, men from two senior judges, um, one in the Court of Appeal and, and one uh, on the circuit bench. And uh, encouragement also from my nephew, who when I said, I really don't think this is for me, Alex, said, what are you frightened of? Failing. Um, and it was really the combination of the three of them that ever made me put in the application at all. I wouldn't have otherwise. The whole application process was grueling. I wished I hadn't done it uh, until I discovered I got the job, in which case I was um, delighted to have done it. So about four and a half, five years into being a judge, I moved to the Old Bailey, where I've been ever since. When I first went there, there were 16 full-time judges, uh, 15 men and me. Now we are down, I think, to 12, perhaps even 11 full-time judges. And until very recently, until one of us retired, there were six women there. So the proportion has changed unbelievably, and I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud to be here today with two of my fellow women judges at the Old Bailey. Um, I was called in 1984. I practiced um, almost exclusively in the Southwest and almost exclusively in criminal law, certainly for after about five years call, I specialized in crime only. I took silk in 2001 and was in silk for just under 10 years before I was made a judge. I was appointed to Portsmouth Crown Court, where I sat for six years. I had a murder ticket at quite an early stage in that process and was um, appointed to sit in the Court of Appeal Criminal Division with that murder ticket, but couldn't try any murder cases because Portsmouth wasn't a tier one court. As a result of, very like Judge Joseph, encouragement from two men, one, both actually Court of Appeal judges, who I worked with on the Sentencing Council, I was encouraged to apply to the Old Bailey, which would never have crossed my mind. I'd only set foot over the threshold of the Old Bailey once as a junior in a murder case, and I knew nothing about it, the setup or anything that was involved there. But it, with the carrot of the prospect of trying murder cases, I applied, utterly daunted, didn't think for a second that somebody from the West Country would have a chance and was successful in my application as one of the six to whom Judge Joseph has referred. Um, there were, uh, I was in the same lot appointed as Judge Molyneux, who's here today. Hello. Um, well, I decided I wanted to be a judge when I was five years old. Um, I was at the mixed infants in Merseyside as one of 56 children in a classroom with a very harassed teacher who'd been brought out of retirement to cope with the baby boom. And she was um, at her wit's end 
So she asked us all to say what we wanted to be when we grew up. Perhaps she was rather wishing we would. Um, I had no idea that there were jobs. Um, all I'd ever done was run wild around the fields where I was growing up. But I had seen a program on the telly called Crown Court. So I knew about judges and barristers and solicitors, and I couldn't spell barrister or solicitor, so I put judge. Um, and I spelt it J-U-G-E, missing out a D. She made me stay behind and write it out a hundred times. So after that, I thought, well, blimey, I'm not changing career path now. <laughs> so the decision was made. Um, but I came from a family where nobody had ever been to university or got an O-level or anything like that. So it seemed a bit unlikely for quite a long time. I went to university, I did a law, um, got a law degree, and then went off to law school where I did the solicitor's finals and then became a solicitor. I came to London to be a solicitor, believing, as we all did, that London streets were paved with gold. So I came to London and got a job in a firm with three partners, um, which nobody had ever heard of. I wouldn't have been allowed to go to the bar because you would have to have some money to do that. Um, I had no money from anywhere, so I had to be able to pay my rent from the very beginning. And of course, I didn't know a single person in London, so it wasn't as though anybody was going to say, well, why don't you come and have a chat in our chambers? But the desire to be a judge had never, never left me. I stayed on being a solicitor and by a series of accidents became a partner in an international law firm where I specialised in commercial litigation and competition law, which gave me a chance to meet lots of people in amazing positions and most of my work was done in boardrooms. And it was along that way that I did meet people who are now senior members of the judiciary or retired indeed, and who every now and then would drop a word of encouragement into my ear one of them suggesting that I might like to try and be a recorder. I didn't have the least idea what they were. I had played one in Miss Forshaw's when we sat on our mat playing Go and Tell Aunt Nancy, but I didn't even know what recorders were in the judicial system. But with that encouragement, and really all of life is about the right word at the right time and realising that every day you can learn something from someone. With that encouragement, I did apply to become a recorder clunked off for the interview at the JAC with a bag load of good luck cards and lucky hankies and by some miracle was appointed. The journey from being a recorder to being a CJ would take up way more time than we have in this interview this morning. Um, all I would say is that I wanted to be a judge so much by then that I would have hired a minibus and a megaphone and crossed Britain saying give me a chance. Um, and then by miracle, in 2007, I was appointed. Best day ever, that envelope on the mat. I ripped the envelope over and I have the ripped envelope still. To go to the Bailey was just beyond even my wildest imaginings, which is something I told the selection board at the JAC interview. When they asked me why I wanted to go there, they were a little bit cross with me when I said I don't want to go there really. Um, they thought, well, why are you wasting our time? I didn't want to go there really because I was very happy where I was. But the reason I made the application is because I wanted to be in the best court in the world if I was to have that chance. They gave me that chance and I'm grateful every morning. So I came rather later to the ambition than Anne but I was laughed out of my first pupillage interview um, because when they said, where do you see your career going? I said, I want to be a judge. Um, their answer to that was no, we've meant in three to five years. Um, I <laughs> kept that flame alive though. Um, and um, I've got two children um, quite close together, 17 months between them. And when I returned from maternity leave the second time, you can imagine my practice at the bar had almost completely collapsed. At that stage, I was really lucky um, and a, a large case that the junior arrived in Chambers. And I worked for about a year on that case. But by the time I came to the end of that case, even more of my practice had disappeared. So I looked around for other things that I could do. Uh, and at that stage, I applied to become a deputy district judge um, and I did, started doing a lot of lecturing for central law training. Um, when I was appointed a deputy district judge, <coughs> the senior member of the bar who'd led me um, in that large case um, came into my room and said, what a waste of talent. 
he thought I'd been offered a full-time job and that um, for a barrister to take a job as a district judge was a waste of ability. Well, <clears throat> in some ways that acted as a spur to me to tell other people where to get off. Um, I did eventually take a, a full-time job as um, a district judge because um, at that stage my practice involved 12 or 13 weeks away from home a year and I was finding with two children aged 9 and 10 I was just becoming more and more miserable. Um, so as a district judge, I slept in my own bed every night um, and I was able to give them the attention that at that stage um, they needed. So for me, um, the combination of the ambition always to be a judge plus the um, ability to obtain a bit more of a work-life balance than I could in practice was, was what attracted me in the first place. Um, I was a district judge for five years um, and then the designated family judge at Watford where I was sitting called me into his room and said this isn't in my interests in any way but I feel in all conscience I must tell you you should apply in the next circuit judge competition. Um, so that was lovely um, and very encouraging and I know he wrote me a super reference so um, he was one of the important people along the way. The other important person along the way, um, and still an important person, is Alice Robinson, who was um, my first six pupil mistress um, and is now the resident of Croydon and has been a friend of mine for years and years. I've watched Alice's judicial career develop some years ahead of mine uh, and always um, had an ambition to follow um, her in her footsteps. So that's where I've got to. I was appointed to Harrow. Um, in 2018. Um, we're a very happy crew at Harrow. Um, majority women, five out of eight of us women, uh, and um, that brings perhaps a different atmosphere to the court um, than I've enjoyed anywhere else. I was quite anxious about starting work in a place where there were a majority of women. I have never, ever worked with women in numbers in any of the places that I have worked. Um, my chambers had a reputation in Lincoln's Inn, so I was in Chancery, um, for having a high proportion of women. Um, that was five out of 29. So um, it's a different world at Harrow, and I'm very grateful for my lovely colleagues. Um, I was called to the bar in 94. Um, I didn't really know anybody at the bar, and I didn't really know any solicitors. Um, I started my uh, life doing philosophy and English at Sussex and then um, I came out in the early 90s and there was a recession so I thought well I better get a profession so I did the law conversion course um, and then um, went to bar school and um, at the law conversion course I had thought well I'll become a solicitor because I don't really have a lot of confidence uh, and I met a fabulous woman whose father was a solicitor and said, you'll be bored out of your brain, go to the bar. So I followed her to Inner Temple, signed the form um, and went to the bar. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I went and did a common law pupillage and then ended up um, on my first day in my second six going to the Bailey um, to make a bail application. Um, I, I really didn't know what I was doing. Uh, eventually, I applied to become uh, a recorder in 2000, and I was appointed in 2009. Again, I thought, well, I'm never going to get it. Um, it was a last-minute application. I did it over overnight, stayed up really late. But I knew that I was passionate about it and that I felt that I wanted to become a judge. Um, I had started to think when I was in the courtroom uh, as a barrister, that I was really interested in what the judge was doing, almost more really than I was in anything else in the courtroom. And um, uh, so I became a re recorder and I was sent to Canterbury to do my judicial training um, under Adele Williams, who was resident there. And I heard she was really scary um, and, you know, this was quite far from where I lived. But it was the most wonderful experience and Adele Williams was incredibly supportive of me. Um, and I began to do more and more sitting as a recorder and then applied full-time and was appointed in 2017 and began to sit at Harrow in 2018 at the same time as Judge Wood. Um, and I haven't looked back. I feel um, that I've been liberated uh, by becoming a judge. It's so much 
much more fun for me and I feel like I make so much more of a difference which is why when Wickle was set up um, I volunteered to become a judicial mentor. Thank you. I come from a family where no one prior to my generation had been to university. My dad was a minor, my mum was a secretary. Um, I had no idea about the law, had no wish to go into the law. And when I fluffed up my A-levels, I ended up getting into a law degree um, through clearing. So I'd seen my future as being business, shoulder pads, swishing about, having business lunches. Um, but I loved being in the law. Um, from my perspective, there was no option to go to the bar because by that stage, my dad had been made redundant after the minor strike. Um, I had siblings who'd gone to university and my family could not have supported me uh, through pupillage. So it was um, expected that if I was going to do this, I would have to go uh, and become a solicitor. So that's what I did. I did training in Exeter in Devon, quite small county town loved it but really only loved crime um, and so became a, an assistant solicitor in a very nice firm in Exeter who were never going to make me a partner in a million years because crime didn't make enough money for them and eventually I left and set up my own firm and ran that for 15 years uh, as a duty solicitor and as a single parent uh, eventually, for reasons that I won't bore anyone with, the Legal Aid Authority made it very difficult for me um, to sit as a recorder and be a partner in a firm. And so at that stage, I went to the bar. I became a recorder and I started this journey because of a, a male judge who called me into his chambers, I thought, for a severe telling off um, when I appeared quite soon into becoming a solicitor advocate and who in fact told me that he thought I should be, or I should apply to be a recorder. And, and just like Anne, I had no idea really what the process was, that solicitors were allowed to do it. And I had to go away and read it up before I could apply. All the way through my journey, the people who have supported me most, I have to be honest, have been men. That's generally because the, the people I've worked with have been men. Um, but they've always been incredibly generous and working at Harrow with the majority of women, again, first time I've ever done that. And I was a bit tentative about it when we started because I'm used to being in a very blokey environment, especially at the police station. Um, but I love it. It's great. And just like Daphna, I agree. I, I feel absolutely freed by being able to make decisions and use my judgment and and try to see the bigger picture perhaps the bigger picture that not everybody sees when they haven't lived through that process they don't know what it's like to be at the police station at two o'clock in the morning um, or understand the caution or what's said to appropriate adults in interview and, and how that works um, so I love it I absolutely love it and I really hope more solicitors start down this route? Well, I had quite a conventional uh, route to the judiciary. I did uh, law at university, then I did pupillage at a specialist criminal set. I prosecuted and defended for about 10 years, and then uh, gradually I got onto the Treasury Council uh, route uh, into the Old Bailey as uh, a TC, and ended up prosecuting terrorism and murder and national security cases and advising the government in different ways. Um, all the way through that period, I realized that mentoring is intrinsic actually to the legal profession. Pupillage, training contracts are all about mentoring, uh, getting alongside someone, learning the skills, seeing how it's done, picking up the ethos of the profession, which is just as important as the skills. And I have to say in the 25 years that I was at the bar, I think there were probably hundreds of men and women who mentored me in different ways. Uh, sometimes just standing or sitting in court, listening to someone doing something brilliantly was so inspiring. And I had the privilege of appearing in front of so many excellent judges, mainly men, but then uh, later on in my career, more and more women. 
and all of that uh, was delightful and it just made me feel that um, perhaps when the time came I would want to be a judge and then I became a recorder again that was quite natural it was the kind of thing that people in my chambers did after they were a certain number of years core um, and then when I was Treasury Council uh, the High Court needed Deputy High Court judges who had some experience of criminal law and uh, public law. And I had done some extradition work uh, for the government and it was suggested that I uh, offered to do it, so I did. And I found that fascinating. And then uh, a few years later, I became a full-time High Court judge. That was five years ago. And I think mentoring has been a natural part of my professional life from the beginning. Justice Chief McGrath, obviously, an awful lot of what we're here for today came from you. Myself and Katie Thorne QC came to see you and we discussed your ideas in respect of creating these judicial mentoring circles. Can you tell us a little bit more about where the idea came from, why it was that you thought this was something we should create in Women on Criminal Law? Well, the germ of this idea is 30 years old. That's as long as I've been in the profession. And when I was a pupil in Michael Kalisher's chambers, he asked me to do some research and then to go and present it at the Criminal Bar Association committee meeting. And while I was there, I was introduced to a fabulous female silk and Rafferty Queen's Council. And it was just a momentary conversation, a couple of minutes. Six months later, I was coming up out of Temple Tube Station and she was coming down the stairs. And you know what she did? She stopped and she said, hello, Bobby, how's pupiling? How's it going? And again, we spoke for a couple of minutes. But when I walked away from that encounter, I just thought how utterly natural it was that she, an eminent barrister who was so polished and admired, had just spoken to me as if I was a member of the profession, how natural it felt. And I've carried that encounter with me through the years. And I thought about it probably hundreds of times because that sense of belonging, that sense of naturally being part of this wonderful profession uh, was an incredibly priceless thing to give to me as a young pupil. And so the idea that women judges eminent women like all the ones you have on this um, call can share their experience, make some other women feel that they belong is really where that whole idea came from. And I think when um, we were talking about Wickle and, and how judges could help, I discussed it with Heather Hallett, who was also um, instrumental in the idea. And judges do a lot of mentoring in different ways. In fact, judges are very busy people, as, as you know. And most of the mentoring that we are asked to get involved in, encouraged by the Lord Chief Justice, um, is one-to-one. -one. It's for people who want to apply for judicial office, uh, through our uh, inns, through um, Judicial Appointments Commission, lots and lots of different routes. But I wondered if Wickle could do it slightly differently and find a way of mentoring a group of women at the same time, all of different seniorities, and so this idea of, of uh, a mentoring circle came up. And I, I've spoken to people, and some of the people who are being mentored by some of the women judges on this call, and they're so thrilled and delighted because it goes not just the judge having to mentor everybody, but actually mentoring going around the circle at different levels. And I think that's one of the most exciting parts of it because actually, do you know, there's a thing called mentoring up. And as judges, we need to hear what it's like on the ground. And as well as sharing our experiences, like Lana and others, I had children. It was very tough coming back into the profession after each child. And just being able to know that there are women who've succeeded, who are senior judges, and they are willing to share that is, I think, a wonderful ingredient of Wickle. So I spoke to you, I spoke to Katie, we had that meeting. You've done an enormous amount of work to set it all up. I emailed some of my favourite judges, um, at least three of whom are on this um, call at the Old Bailey, and I said, what about this idea? 
and uh, and they were enthusiastic as I knew they would be because all the best people are always prepared to do something else to help others um, and that's how it all started and I'm so thrilled that it's going so well. Can I ask um, anybody else when you first heard about it what was it that made you want to get involved what did you hope to achieve by joining the scheme? I had no idea really um, like Bobby says I think those of us who are enthusiastic tend to put our hands up and just say yes and see what happens as a result of saying yes. Um, I didn't particularly feel that I had a lot to offer. And after I met my group, I felt I had even less to offer because they are the most awe-inspiring women I think I've ever met uh, as a group. That I expected some sort of shrinking violets, a bit of shyness, a bit of um, reluctance to share personal and professional problems, but, but they are so open and so awe-inspiring that whatever I expected, and I don't quite know what I did expect, it, it, it's exceeded my expectations by miles. And to see the in the time, I think it's 18 months since I set up my circle, and it may be coincidence, it may not be, but each one of them had an aspiration. I've now got seven in my group. Each one of them had an aspiration and a professional or personal difficulty. We've had a, a, a one who lost her husband in an accident suddenly, a mother of two very young children, one whose husband walked out on her. So there have been personal difficulties and then professional problems, a very young, driven criminal solicitor who felt that the men senior to her in her firm were thwarting her ambition to um, excel. She's now been made a partner um, I've got a QC who wanted to do something other than just practice. She's now been made an assistant coroner. They're a, a very young criminal barrister who's written a book, which launched last week on sentencing youths, which is a very challenging area. So I haven't answered your question because I don't know what I expected, but that's what's happened as a result of doing this. The, the reason I did it was um, really because I'm so much older than any of you. When I came into the, into the barrister's profession, there were relatively few women around and it was awful. I was um, not taken seriously. I was treated like an amusing toy around chambers. When I... Uh, began my uh, second six, I was called from the very first day to the very last day by my clerk, sir. Um, there was no acknowledgement that one might realistically have a career. And over the years, I've seen those problems disappear but other sorts of problems linger under the surface. And I think it's nothing but sheer luck that I got through it. And I don't think others should have to depend on luck. I think that we should all be there for each other um, to see each other through. So I was very enthusiastic about supporting people professionally through the difficulties of the profession. What surprised me about the whole thing is that every meeting we have, and we have a lot of meetings, um, we speak less about professional matters and more about supporting each other personally, which of course has knock-on effect on supporting people professionally as well. If people are having problems at home, if they've got difficulties with the kids, whatever's going on at home reflects on the amount of time and energy you've got to commit to the job. So I've been uh, surprised at how the ambit of what we do has developed. And I have been delighted at the way in which we have simply naturally become friends. And we, there's now, there's six of us in the group. I, I, I don't think um, I am a judicial mentor. I think we are a mentoring group. I think we do support each other, but it's been extraordinary how these completely diverse set of women uh, from 
all areas of the criminal law, all ages, all experiences, all backgrounds, simply have become friends. And I'm one of the things I suspect that um, we're going to be asked is who would want to say to other people, why would you do what we're doing? And there's a very simple answer to that. The answer is, why wouldn't you do it? it you get more than you give in this situation. And, and I found it um, absolutely enlightening and a whole pleasure. Judge Francis, I know you've joined more recently. Um, what was it that made you get involved? It was really because there were other judges at my court um, that were doing it who encouraged me. And um, I actually held off for quite a while because my view was, well, how can I mentor anyone? I'm, I still got L plates on as a judge. Um, I, I've got nothing to offer. And having met my group, I, I still feel that, if I'm honest, um, because they are amazing. But we're the lockdown crew. We, we were formed um, just as we went into lockdown. And so far, we've had two Zoom um, lockdown meetings together. And, and we keep talking about wine bars and, and hoping for the best. But whether that will happen, I don't know. Um, just as, as Sarah and Wendy have said, I am so amazed by how fabulous my group are, how hard they work, um, what fabulous careers they've already forged. And also, and, and I was struck by this in, in our meetings, how open they are. And, and it's been described, our meetings are described as a safe space, somewhere that you can say the stuff that you can't say at work because you don't want to be seen as weak or, um, or not being prepared to do things. And, and I, I suppose I haven't expected that in some ways. And I'm, I'm really glad that people have that um, rather than just going home and having a glass of wine and a scream, which is perhaps what we did. So I, I think it's, it's fabulous. And I'm so glad I've done it now. Um, I wish I'd done it earlier. I wish we had done the wine bar thing before lockdown. If I'm honest. <laughs> Judge Wood, can I ask you, what was it that you told Judge Francis to encourage her? How did you find your group? <laughs> that, that she shouldn't imagine for a moment that she had nothing to offer. And you've heard from her already. She's a fabulous woman and I could see that she would inspire other women to be equally fabulous. Um, in, in terms of how I came to it, um, I came to one of the um, key things in my decision to apply um, for a judicial appointment was attending a, an association of women judges meeting, which Alison, Alice Robinson dragged me along to. Um, that was a terrifying experience. I walked into one of the rooms at the High Court and it sounded like school because every voice in the room was female and I had hated school. Um, and it made my hackles rise. Um, but it was there that I met the idea of um, the part-time career ladder alongside your full-time job, um, enabling the JAC to see whether you might be a, a good judge um, when you applied. As a district judge, um, I was invited to join um, the Association of um, London District Judges Ladies Dining Club which is called Portia. And, and again, I see Anne's face. My reaction was, why would I want to meet with a whole load of other women? Isn't that terribly exclusive? But I went along for the first meeting and I found it a very refreshing experience. Um, whereas a lot of men around me were all full of things were absolutely fine and there were no problems. The women were much more open. It was a fabulous opportunity to find out what was really happening. Um, at other courts around um, the London group and when I heard that the reason it had been started was because um, in its first iteration there were only four members, only four women district judges in the whole of London, I could see where they'd come from and why it was so important to everybody and it was that experience really that led me to get involved in Wickle. Um, and to want to support the idea of a women-only group um, to support other people professionally. Um, so that's how I ended up then volunteering, pushed by Daphna, 
um, who had already started her own mentoring circle, Pasadena the Mentoring Circle as well. And what have you um, found from your group? How have you seen different people benefit within the group? The, my proudest moment, I have to say, we've been meeting in lockdown as well, is our youngest member um, has had a, a Plymouth housemate. She's the only one who hasn't been furloughed. She describes her house share as party central. She's been having real trouble finding somewhere to work. Uh, and there's been one of her housemates with really intrusive personal problems. And without missing a beat, um, one of our other mentoring circles said, well, my flat in London is empty. I'm staying with my parents. You're very welcome to the Keys. And it was that depth of personal friendship and support um, that really shouted out to me how successfully we've bonded as a group. Um, so I've really enjoyed that. Judge Spiro, it seems that you were the initial Harrow judge who encouraged everybody else. Um, can you tell us about your group? Well, we've all got wonderful groups, um, uh, and I think mine must be the best out of everybody's. Um, uh, I've, I, they're all just wonderful, and I felt like a complete imposter, but that was the reason that I put myself forward, because I thought, well, if I feel like an imposter, um, there must be lots and lots of other women in the profession who do. Um, I never had any formal or really informal mentoring, although I've got some wonderful friends um, who are senior women at the bar who have always been very supportive of me. But I remember um, when I wanted to apply to become a judge that at some stage, I can't remember when it was, that I watched Anne Molyneux's video on the JAC website. And I thought, how refreshing to have somebody who um, is, is what I consider to be so normal, somebody who I can relate to um, and somebody who has had different but analogous life experiences and, and so that's why I, I put myself forward. Um, and uh, the group is, uh, we, there are three solicitors, two barristers. So there are six of us. Uh, we meet once every couple of months or so, two, three months. Uh, we met at uh, the senior um, woman in the group is a, a senior solicitor. She's a partner in a wonderful firm with views of the river. So we, we met there initially. Then we had our Zoom meetings with on, always on a Thursday because that's when we start the drinking weekend. So we, for those of us who don't drink during the week, we'll have a glass of wine on a Thursday. Um, and we've got our first post or easing of lockdown meeting at an all women club that the most junior member is a member of, uh, perhaps somewhere called Albright, I think, in Maddox Street. We're going to um, next week next Thursday uh, where we're going to have a socially distant drink and the reason that that happened is that two of the members have been living on their own and uh, it has been quite lonely during lockdown and so we thought well we'll meet in a park uh, we'll just meet when we were allowed to um, so that we can see each other and have some social contact and I agree with everybody that that spoken that it's more it's more of a friendship and a support uh, but within a professional context. So we have combined at every meeting uh, where, where we're at professionally, where we're going, um, judicial aspirations. And I, and I was asking them what, if any benefit they've found from it. And the interesting thing from the most junior member of the circle is that although she's too junior to apply for a judicial post, she's thinking about it. And so when she is ready in a year or two's time, uh, she will have had the experience and got the um, evidence-based um, information that she can put in, in her form. Um, so we do mix, you know, recommendations of podcasts, uh, books, Netflix with our, our professional lives. And it's definitely um, an upward and sideways mentoring as well as um, the, the judicial mentoring and I think we've all benefited from it um, so I'm, I'm not sure if that's an answer to the to the questions Amy. <laughs> no that's brilliant. Um, Judge Molyneux I, obviously I'm on your group so uh, I hope you're pleased with it. Um, you want to tell us a bit about why you got involved and what you think we've achieved Yes, Amy, I, I wondered whether you were going to say um, that we are, in <laughs> fact, <laughs> in the same group. 
Um, and I was going to come to that and ask you to speak about our group because you're in a very good place to judge it. So when I got the email um, from Bobby, my first thought was, oh, crikey, now what? Um, because um, I thought, oh, golly, what is this mentoring women's group going to be all about? I, I suppose um, I don't really like soundbitey things, but I'm quite keen on this one. I think um, life is very much a question of each one teach one. So we all learn from the people around us, as others have said, all day long. And I think I've learned from the people around me something new every day. And I try to help whoever happens to be around me um, in whatever walk of life they are every day. So the idea of a formal women's group filled me with some manner of dread. But um, I went along to it. And I have to say that I ate not only my croissant, but my, my words. Because from the moment we first met, it has been a very enriching and uplifting experience. I think I could paper the wall with my disadvantages in my life. They're obvious for anyone to see. Um, but the real advantage, the thing that has got me through, is when somebody a step ahead of me, because they're maybe a bit older or they're a bit further down the line, but somebody who I respect has turned to me and said, you can do this. That makes me believe in it in a way that I wouldn't have otherwise. So it has been a very enriching experience and I have learned so much from every single member of our group. It's wonderful because it gives you a chance to see the future. It gives you a chance to see how young people are looking. And we have a, a student in our group, do we not, Amy? Um, and she was able to point out to us all only this week that the way the law has been interpreted in this country has been wrong for quite a long time. Um, and she's seeing things with her new and fresh eyes. From Amy, I've learned what it's like to be running a law firm, a criminal law firm, and to be working all hours of the day and night and dashing off to the police station on a moment's notice. I wouldn't have known anything about that otherwise and so on so it is an enriching experience and something which i enjoy very much so thanks, yeah, thanks, officially thanks, the the, <laughs> thanks for the email bobby justice chief McGrub, can i ask you whether everything you've heard is what you'd hoped for yes i think um what these fantastic women judges have been saying just illustrates the point doesn't it that we all have so much within us and the remarkable thing about the majority of women in the criminal justice professions is that they're so modest, they're so unassuming, they're so um, decent and kind, just like Anne Rafferty was all those years ago to a completely anonymous pupil. And these women have demonstrated, haven't they, just what rich uh, offerings they can bring to each other and to the lives of the uh, people in our profession. I'm I'm, I'm so moved. I'm utterly delighted by it. And I hope that this um, conversation inspires lots of other women judges to take part. You know, uh, Anne's absolutely right. You know, um, each one teach one. But uh, with these mentoring circles, you're teaching five, six, seven people. And they are then going to go on and model that to others. And what a wonderful thing to create. Isn't that just absolutely fantastic? I'm, I'm thrilled. Thank you, all of you. It's wonderful. Thank you. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure um, creating all of your circles and even just having the email exchanges with you all and how welcoming, how inspiring you all are, but also how willing you've been to give your time and the feedback we get from all the women in your groups is amazing they are all so so grateful and they all feel that they're benefiting so we can't thank you enough I've said thank you quite a few times um I was last night watching um Justice Chima Grubb's video for the first hundred years and there was a few things that you said which I just thought was hopefully what we're doing through these circles one of the things you said was about making the right step at the right time and not drawing back and I think that's what everybody seems to be saying, even all of you who have achieved so much, who've said about not maybe feeling ready to do it or needing to be pushed. And I hope that's what we're doing through the judicial circles. 
Um, you also said the tide is rising of able women and I really hope that that continues and WIC will continue to support that. Um, Bravo, quite right. <laughs> quite right too. The only other final thing is if there's anybody, anything anybody would say to encourage anybody else to take part and to join our scheme. One of the things that um, a member of my group said which I thought was quite interesting is that being part of the circle has made it easier to go to networking events because she knows that she'll always be able to see a familiar face and it's something that she was really reluctant to do uh, beforehand um, so I, I think that's and, and actually for me when I go to these events it's just lovely to see friendly familiar faces that are not necessarily from my courtroom or from my chambers um, but just from all different parts of the, the criminal law profession so that that's a, a good thing I think even if you don't want to become a judge immediately you just from the circle you, you meet so many other people. I think the reason why I'd encourage judges to uh, offer themselves to this is that judges are very very good at listening and they're very good at understanding what somebody means uh, irrespective of what they actually say. And I don't think that um, the judge ought to feel that everybody in their group will have the same goal as the judge did. Uh, I think one of the wonderful things is the variety of goals that legal professionals have these days and how the horizon changes as years go on. So like most people, um, most judges didn't expect to be judges when they started off on their career. And I think the quality of being a good listener who can really interpret what's going on in someone's uh, mind and heart when they're speaking is one of the reasons why I think judges must make particularly good mentors. And the other thing is that um, as women sharing with, with other women, not just is it a safe place, but it's a place where your voice can be heard. And having the experience of women listening to you, listening to what you're saying, must help each of the women in the in the mentoring circle when they need to to say something in other settings because they know they've been listened to carefully and seriously and um, that's a very very valuable gift that judges can give to others in the profession i think one thing i'd like to add is that we don't appreciate how many people we know and how easy it is for us to do what others did for us when we were much more junior. Two examples in my group are um, that two of my group had aspirations to become involved in coronial work, having never done it. All I did was to invite them to the old bailey at nine o'clock one morning and introduce them to the chief coroner, which for them was like meeting God, but he's just one of our colleagues. And, and it was just so easy. And the young woman I described as writing the book on youth crime wanted to know a bit more about the sentencing council, which I was on. Um, the chairman is a good friend of mine, and it was very, very easy for me to set up a meeting between the two of them. And I think we've got so much now. Now we have so much of a network ourselves, and it's so easy for us to introduce people that we really owe it to um, younger members of, or different people at different stages to, to involve them in that way. It's so easy. Can I pick up on something um, that Bobby just said? Um, we had a meeting last night, and one of the things uh, that we discussed was this uh, event this morning. And one of the things that was said by a number of the women is what they felt they had got so much out of the group was because they'd been able to build up trust within the group, they'd been able to build up confidence within the group that spilled over once they were outside the group. And I really think that that uh, ability to feel confident in yourself is something that women so obviously sometimes lack. And it's a great gift that we, who are pretty confident in ourselves now, should be able to give to other people. Uh, 
I think um, we're all part of a judiciary which is world-class judiciary and we are all deeply, deeply proud to be a part of that judiciary and we all have a vested interest in ensuring that the judiciary continues to be a world-class judiciary. And apart from it being a great joy to be in a mentoring circle, it's a duty to be in a mentoring circle to make sure that we can nurture other people to go on and become a part of it. Thank you so much for your time. And I should say, in respect of the confidence, um, I was really nervous about meeting you all this morning. Um, <laughs> imposter syndrome definitely sets in and you think, oh my goodness, these seven amazing judges are just going to be sat in my kitchen with me having a chat. Um, and Anne sent me a lovely email last night and it really did give me the confidence to go, okay, I, I can do this. I can speak with these amazing people. Well, you've done fantastically well. Well done, Amy. Yes. Yeah. Well done, Amy. Thank you so much, Amy. Yeah, it's so you. lovely to see everyone. Hi. <laughs> Have a good day, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. 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 B